I want to uh, read for us the scripture lesson for this morning. This is taken from Paul's epistle to the Philippian church, which Paul himself uh, started. If you want to, you can read the 16th chapter of the book of Acts and find the story there. In any case, uh, Paul is addressing a situation in the church, and this is a very good church, a church that Paul is very much in love with, and they with him. Nonetheless, he is reminding them with verse 5 through verse 11, let this mind be with you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, before the beginning of time, equal to God, because Jesus was God, that's an editorial comment on my part, he did not re regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, us, and again some editorial, assuming humanity, being conceived and found in appearance as a human. And he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him and gave him a name which is above every other name. So that at the name uh, given to Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on, and on earth, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. Pray with me, please. Oh Lord, please allow it to be that the frailties and uh, the um, struggles of the human instrument called to uh, bring your word this day will in no way fetter or, or uh, complicate the hearing of that word and the way we embrace it to our lives, to our hearts, to our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If I could jettison one sentence and only one sentence from my Bible, it would be this verse from the second chapter of Matthew. It reads, they are no more. And they is a reference to the children. The children are no more. Wonderful children's sermon this morning and it was wonderful to see all the kids gathered there. But there was a time in history, the time of Jesus and his birth, when the children were no more. Now, the, the, the story that surrounds this is an incredible saga. Uh, wise men from the Far East arrive with gifts to worship the newborn babe, and they tell King Herod, we are searching for the child who is born King of the Jews. Alas, Herod was king of the Jews. There can be only one king at a time, and Herod will use all power in his, uh, in his disposal to take this baby out. When Herod's lie to the wise men fails to do uh, what he had hoped it would, uh, he turn, the, the story turns south. There will be a dark side to the end of the story. Reading again from the good book, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. He was irate. He had anger that was beyond control. Rage. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem 
who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had heard from the wise men. All the children, the children are no more. Placing this in something contemporary, three years from now, the school district will have to furlough the kindergarten teacher because the children are no more. Why did this have to happen? It's the hardest thing in my Bible for me to read. Yet, I believe that there is a spiritual and moral lesson to be had if we can look carefully, and that is that the lust of power can be one of the most deadly sins any leader, any person can commit. The lust for power, the sense of entitlement, the enormous pride combine that innocent people will be led to suffer and those people, many will die. Of those people, many will die. When prideful, arrogant leadership takes hold, it can cause an entire nation to teeter and fall. Flags of freedom can drop to the dirt only to be replaced by those of thugs and tyrants. As I read scripture, and I do read scripture, I find no references to the virtues of pride and or arrogance. On the other hand, there are numerous examples calling us to practice humility. For we have, as mortals, been told what is good. And what does the Lord require of us but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God? God seems to desire and to honor the presence of humility within the heart and soul of those to whom God has given life. Could this be because we are able to see it in somebody else? And I wonder, and this is fascinating to me, this is just something that, that leads me to awe. If we could look deeply into the heart and soul of our maker, would we find any evidence of arrogance or pride? We Christians claim Jesus to be both fully human and fully divine. Does a God of arrogance, a God of pride, a deity of pride, allow for spit to run down his face or to bleed drops of blood from a criminal's cross? The two greatest men in my life's journey were my little league coach and a ruling elder from the last church I served in McKeesport. Both were faithful Christian leaders but more impressive to me was that both of these men, despite the fact that they had leadership responsibilities in the church, both could be found to be working at the church when repairs were needed or some work of the hand and heart was required. They were not only leaders, they were servants. And when as, I, as all of us will soon be doing when we are looking at candidates uh, to lead us and serve us in our nation. 
How many will talk of leading and leading and leading and doing this and doing that? I will be listening for those who make comments about how they will serve. I cannot remember the name of my fifth grade teacher. I remember that she was older than most of the other teachers I had had, but she wasn't old, and she carried herself with, carried herself with gentleness and grace. And somehow I knew that she was a believer. I can't say that I was a believer, though I had a little spark of faith in me somewhere. But this woman had something I didn't have in abundance. She had it in abundance. An abundant measure of whatever it was. And I think I know what it is that she had now. She had Jesus in there. And she brought Jesus with her to her work. And she took Jesus with her everywhere she went. So now it's time for us to look at the scripture lesson. So let's uh, reread some of what we read a few minutes ago. Let the apostle Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, speak to us. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he, was, he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped or exploited, but emptied himself. Taking the form of a servant, assuming for a season of the history of history, for a season in time, space, history, he assumed humanity, being conceived and found in appearance as a human. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, so that at the name given to Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul tells us that Jesus humbled himself. I, I want to give you some examples of how Jesus humbled himself. Number one, Jesus left his station as the majestic ruler of the universe, left his status as almighty God, left his divinity to take upon himself humanity. Number two, in order to do so, almighty God and Jesus allowed himself to be born in a smelly stable with no crib for a bed. Number three, in order to take on humanity, Jesus had to allow himself to be born to a mother and father who would find themselves to be homeless wanderers, refugees, if you will, for the first couple years of Jesus' life. Now, numbers four, five, and six, I know nothing about, none of us do. But Jesus had a period of growing up between the age of 12 and the age of 30 before he reappeared in history. And somewhere in those, uh, what would it be now, 18 years, there had to be a four, five, and six of ways that Jesus humbled himself. So let's move to number seven, the day of Jesus' baptism. Jesus has hustled into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights living in hand-to-hand -hand spiritual combat with the most powerful force of evil ever known to humanity. Number eight, from day one of his ministry of love and care to the least and the last and the lost, Jesus is hounded, Jesus is hated, not by the bad people, 
but by the so-called holy people of his time. Number nine. In the end, those who have hated and hounded see that he suffers and dies in the most horrific and painful way possible. But only after he has been mocked and spit upon and whipped in the most barbaric way ever devised by humankind and stripped naked, hands and feet nailed to the cross and there left to die. Does that qualify Jesus that Paul should say to us he humbled himself? He made a choice, a decision, a commitment to journey into humility. And the deeper and the longer the journey, Jesus found that humility would turn into humiliation into suffering, into death. Yet those of us who walk with Jesus in this day, the Jesus that we believe blesses us and guides us and is with us every moment by the power and truth and presence of the Holy Spirit, when we do that, when we believe that Jesus is walking with us daily, we are walking hand in hand with the living God. We are walking hand in hand with royalty, with majesty, with power, with love. I, I may be stealing someone's thunder for next Sunday. Uh, but I want to lift up as an example of humble leadership, someone who himself had some degree of issue uh, of, uh, that, make us very, that makes us very uncomfortable. Nonetheless, a, he was a humble servant. And I, I speak of George Washington. I watched a special on TV this week about him. And historians with great reputations from entire, uh, entirely across the United States point out that, G, that, G, that Washington, and please believe me, Washington is no Jesus. I almost said Jesus. In fact, that gives me a chance to say something to us. Do you understand that there is a great chasm Read Luke chapter 16 about the great chasm. There is a great chasm between the holiness of Jesus and the holiness we hold in our hearts. So there's a great chasm between Jesus and Washington. Nonetheless, I, uh, nonetheless he uh, is heralded for the fact that he was able to maintain great stature and great respect despite the fact that he had a countenance of humility. And I think I may have the answer as to why. Because Washington was called upon to do something, and he said that he believed that he had been called upon by providence. He said it over and over again. He was called to do something that no other human being on earth could do. Something that Washington himself could not do. And that is to take a ragamuffin bunch of soldiers who are basically farmers and the only reason they know how to use a rifle is because they hunt and they come together to defeat the greatest power the earth had ever seen up to that point in time, the British Empire. With all of its ships and all of its soldiers and all of its power and with its king and 
quietly, Washington made it known to one of his contemporaries, I don't think I can do this. But he did it because there was nobody else to do it. Sounds like church sometimes, doesn't it? You're called to do something and you know you can't do it. But somebody's got to do it. And that's the issue and, and, and that's, the, that's the thing I'm trying to talk about. That is, yes, it's true. We can't do it without providence, without God. We can't do it on our own. Now, there are a lot of things I can do on my own without God. But raising my children, no way. No way. A lot of things I can't do without, without God. That was, that was George Washington. And for eight years, for eight years of his life, there was suffering, hardship, death, destruction, deprivation, betrayal, and pitiful support from the congressional leadership. And he was outnumbered and outclassed by an enemy great and powerful. And he did it. He did it. He won. He won for us. Would that not create within a person a sense of humility? Same would hold true of Moses. God called on Moses, to whom the Bible refers in this way in the book of Numbers. Now the man Moses was very humble, more so than anyone else on the face of the earth. And God called upon Moses, this most humble man, to deliver the Israelites from the clutches of the most powerful man on the planet at the time, King Pharaoh. And Moses won. And Pharaoh lost. But not before the entire land of Egypt was stripped bare of its resources. And I quote, Nothing green was left, no tree, no plant in the field in all the land of Egypt. All of the livestock of the Egyptians died. The entire army of Pharaoh was drowned. The land devastated. The firstborn dead. The entire army drowned and Pharaoh himself lying face down in the mud never to bring harm again. That's what happens when a leader lusts for power and will do anything to keep it. Children die. People die. The land dies. And the other story, which is far worse than any other worst story we can come up with, is what Adolf Hitler's lust for power did. It was unleashed upon the world at large. 20 million soldiers, 40 million civilians died because of deliberate genocide, massacres, mass bombing, disease, and starvation. All because one man, with the help and support of deranged followers, caused more heartache and more suffering and more death in that six-year period than anyone in history. So it's time to end this. I think I've made my point. Except to say that when I pass to be with the Lord and I encounter Jesus wherever that might be, I will be among those whom Paul said, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Nobody will have to tell me to do it. I won't do it because Paul said I should do it. I'll do it because I can't help but do it in the presence of who Jesus is. 
and then perhaps I'll have a chance to meet my loved ones who have passed before me and my friends. And then I want, last of all, to meet two women from history. The first, who is going to be second in this list, and uh, is Mary, Jesus' mother, for obvious reasons. But the first, and the person I want to spend most time with, the person whose story I want to hear, is another Mary. And that's not Mary Magdalene, though I want to hear her story too. It is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Because Mary was able to do something for Jesus no one on earth was able to do. Not once, but twice. And I have a wonderful sermon. It's my favorite sermon, and it is my best, in case I'm ever asked to come back again. (laughs) And it's about Mary. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory.